Hello, and welcome back to the Bright Founders Talk podcast from Temi. Temi is an international software development company that designs, builds, and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. Today, I'd like to welcome our lovely guest who has had an extremely rich and diverse career, some of which includes being a director for three organizations that work to protect and promote the environment. Alfredo Jimenez, how Hello, Chris. I'm very pleased to be here with you. I, I, I really like to, uh, your initiative, the DEM initiative, and, and to be able to share uh, this experience. I think it's very important. Pleased to be here. Excellent. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. So uh, now before we get down to the serious part, I'd like to ask you a few quick fire questions just to help you settle into today's podcast and also, you know, let everyone know about you. So the first question is, what's the best way to start the day? Well, the, the, for me, the best way to start the day, very easily, I, I hide procrastination. So I wake up around 6 or 6.30, uh, quick breakfast, and I like to jump into to work to do uh, the things that uh, block my mind the first. So uh, that gave me energy uh, for, for the rest of the day. If I have something blocking myself, I, I prefer to start as soon as possible with, with those. Okay, just, you just jump straight in, a quick coffee and you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Quick coffee and heavy breakfast, just something to eat. Okay, energy at the beginning of the day is key, but then I, I really like to start working at road. Seven in the office before most of the people. Uh, and that helps me really to organize my day and to assure uh, efficiency uh, inside the day. Yeah. Okay, excellent. What's your favorite social media app? Which one do you use the most? Well, I honestly, I use a lot LinkedIn. Uh, I really like that because uh, I, I consider it's very sincere in terms of uh, of professionality and to know what people is doing and what they are thinking um in parallel more in in the leisure or pleasure path i like insta instagram just to uh, i like the pictures uh although i have to be careful with the videos because when you realize you are too much time there so you have to be careful but uh, i yeah. like those those two are oh, they are my preferred yeah my favorite yeah if you could describe yourself in three words, which words would you choose and why? Okay, so let's let's go one by one and and try to put the why after each of them. The first one that comes to my mind, and I'm not so happy about that, <laughs> is uh, professional, uh, because I think that it's very important to be professional, to do the things well done. Uh, to have a commitment, uh, a civic commitment with the society. And and we are when we work, we are doing that for something, and especially we are doing that for, for good. So to be for professional is, is very important for me. This is the first word that I consider that describe myself, uh, which I consider the second word could be human. Uh, because it's very important for me to be human. We are... Mm. here for people. That's why I don't like so much that professional comes to me as the first word, but uh, I do that because I like humans. I like different cultures. I like the richness of the planet. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm really committed with sustainability. That would be my third word. Uh, there is no planet if there are no people to live on it. So, uh, yeah, we need to be sustainable. It means that we need to find the way to work, to live uh, in such a way that we respect the planet, uh, because if not, the planet will not respect to us. And and in, in 2000 years, there will be another planet, but with another visitors, not with us. <laughs> so professionally at the daily level, because we are humans, and if we want to respect the humanity, well, we need to be sustainable. There is no other way. Yeah. Mm. It's a really interesting mix of um, of words there. Very nice. Um, and uh, the final one, what was your first ever job? My first ever job? 
And that's a very, very interesting question because I consider, and I suppose that, that you have also the same experience on most of us, the first ever job has a mark, has a ink mark in the way we understand the job. So it was in Christmas because my family had a shop for toys. So all my friends were jealous because I, they thought that I was able to have all the toys that I wanted. Uh, that uh, in Christmas we were going there because the job, we had a lot of work. So just unloading boxes from the trucks and putting them into the shelves and, uh, and selling and then unloading again and uh, making packaging and uh, everything. And, and it was from very early in the morning up to uh, eight or nine at nine. Uh, at night, so um, yeah, it it was uh, very very uh, very useful in terms of understanding what is a is a work uh, or what is a job, which is uh, is professionality. It means that you have to uh, to forget about yourself, how tired you are, uh, if you like or you don't you like. You have to have a smile on your face and to do the things, and then you will get that reward by doing yes. it. But you need to do the things well done. So, yeah, that was yeah. Good. my first uh, memory about you. Yeah. 12 years. So that's, yeah, it's really interesting about, like like you said, it leaves a mark on you for your future, that for first experience in the world of work. Um, so that's what you, th from that job, you think you took, the, the main thing you took from that experience is like to be more professional. Yeah, to to be uh, to be accountable, to be able to have uh, this uh, uh, capacity to understand what the other is expecting from you, because you're making a, a job for the others. So you don't think this is the way I do the job, and you are not being an artist; you are doing a service. Mm -hmm. So uh, then you need to think about what the others expect when they come to you, and uh, for sure, dude inside the limits of uh, of the activity and, and the task that you have received. But uh, yeah, that, that for a kid is just changing uh, register. Okay, we are in the in the gaming, we are in having fun and no, but life needs to have a job in order to be able to, to have that spare time and if not, things doesn't work. So mm. uh, that, that relationship came to me thanks to the, to that first job. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you what is the real uh, anecdotes that I have from there because the whole December uh, is is very loaded, but for sure at the beginning of December we were going to the school and then from the 20s more or less we were every day going to the shop to help on that. And, <clears throat> and the last uh, school day I went with friends, we finished very late, and we finished very late, let's say, <laughs> a little bit drunk. And, and and then the day after, I woke up and I said to my father, uh, which was managing the job, he was the director, and I said to him, uh, Dad, I don't feel very well, uh, perhaps it's better if I don't go to the shop. And he said, uh, look, Alfredo, you, you were okay for the party, so you must be okay for your job. And then everything changed from that moment. And the rest of the day, I was working very hard. So I understood the lesson. So uh, have fun, but job, you cannot skip it, is the priority. So it was the classic, you know, play hard, work hard, right? In terms of... Yeah, exactly. Be, you, be accountable. Work hard and you will be able to play and do whatever you want, but not the other way. Yeah, interesting. Um, well... I've also, you know, it's really interesting that was your first job and your family was, was in that, that industry because I, I've also read that you are a big fan of the environment. So it's interesting if you could take us back to the beginning when you were around that age, like how did, you know, what inspired you to go down this path of involved in the environment in, in, in a general sense and a business sense? Can you explain how, you know, you, you got started and how did it evolve into to a, into a successful career? Okay, that's that's a very interesting question, Chris. And 
I fear that the answer that I'm going to give you is not very different from uh, most of the people that today is involved in the in environment. Is that uh, you, you start many years ago because you are a scouter, you go with the, in summer camps and, and you really love nature. Uh, and you understand the bigness of the nature and how small we are uh, and, and, and you capture this relationship. I, I think that most of the people that uh, feel uh, part of the nature is because we start in it, that having good experiences and, and absorbing those experiences. Uh, and then we, the second phase, when we grow up, professionally and nature is like a hobby. It's not mixed. In, in our generation, the, 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 the sustainability and um, just to, to, to be ecological, it, in some cases, won't, was even political and has nothing to do with politics. But uh, it, it was like a, a, a hobby, so uh, not mixed with the job. But hopefully, since 10 years ago or so, you see that society is waking up and is realizing that uh, we are in a boat. We are, we are not in the, in the possibility to do whatever we want in this planet. We are one with the planet. So if we continue to make a fire in the boat, we will sink it. So uh, th there is no choice. It's not a political decision. It's not a professional decision. There is no choice. So uh, some 10 years ago, you start to hear about sustainability or social responsibility in the companies and you start to make the link look guys you, you can have a lot of profit but uh, if you don't take care that this profit is wasting resources or killing the nature uh, sooner or later your profitability will get lost so uh, it starts to get connected uh, then we have like three or five years ago a phase that hopefully is, is going through, which is the, the green washing. So suddenly everybody is absolutely green and uh, very nice pictures with a forest in the back of uh, all the uh, CEOs and managers. Uh, and now we are, I think, in a very interesting period of our lives. Uh, profitability and sustainability has to be together. Uh, if a company wants to be profitable, uh, not only will have to demonstrate that with, uh, with the indicators, uh, but they will be profitable because the, the talent will remain in the company because we will be willing to work in those companies uh, and because the market will recognize that and because there will be no other choice. The products that they provide have to be uh, sustainable. So I, I have the feeling that the, the will is really moving, and I consider myself very, uh, very, very fortunate to to be in this period of of life that uh, you go from a dream of sustainability and respecting the planet to something that in 10, 20 years I don't say that it will be tomorrow, but uh, we have no choice that in 10 years we must have much more energy from the companies uh, looking for sustainability. And just to give some orientation to the people listening, you're, you're from Spain, right? And and from Valencia specifically. Yeah. And I'm just curious, like with the de design of the city, I feel like they have put, from my experience in the city, they've put a lot of emphasis on making it a more livable city rather than, you know, just making it more economic and, and growing in that sense. Like that, there's that massive park in the middle of the city where the river used to be right and yeah. did that influence you that the city like the way people look in valencia at nature and that kind of thing was it did that influence you to go into it as well like the way you grew up well that's a that's an interesting point of view because in indeed i really love valencia and i really love what i call kind cities and and uh, valencia is is becoming a very kind City. It means that you can go to the street and you have very big alleys and very central areas where you can walk and there are no cars, no big noise, and then it's full of people, suddenly. Uh, I see that you know very well <laughs> our 
uh, our uh, DNA. The, one of the DNAs of Valencia is that one week per year in March, we close the city and we make uh, fireworks and uh, big monuments of paper and wood, and then we burn them uh, on the 17th of, on the 19th of, of March. In that period, the center of the city is closed. So the people, we really love to, to move around. And so we have that experience. Um, but you see, as the question that you make me for about the job, I have another experience when I was a kid uh, that in, I, I had neighbors which were German uh, and natives. And, and they were living in Valencia. And, and they were speaking German between them. Uh, and I said, oh, I would love really to speak other languages. Uh, so in, in almost 30 years career, I have been 15 years outside Valencia. <laughs> so uh, I've not been a very good contributor. I really love when I came back on 2021 after, after uh, 10 years in France. Uh, to see that Valencia was really progressing uh, in a very gentle and very kind city. And personally, I, I know uh, one of the urbanists that was involved in, uh, in, in the consultancy supporting this new reorganization. So we are very in line that, uh, that gentrification has to be avoided. This, this tourism justify everything. No, no, you need to have a good equilibrium between uh, the citizens, the neighborhood, services, uh, businesses, tourism. So a good equilibrium is is helping to that. So uh, yeah, the Valencia in that sense is is a great city to live. I invite everybody to to come. But but not in mass, not looking for uh, big parties and noise, and but just to to go to the lake in the south to see the sun setting. To have nice walk, as you said, we have one of the biggest gardens, uh, which is the old river bed. Uh, so uh, it was dangerous because uh, we can have big uh, rains in in October. So uh, to avoid these uh, floods to come into the city, the river was deviated. So we found this river bed. What to do with that? And so we did the, one of the biggest and nicest uh, parts. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it when I visited. Um, after it was actually recently after the the pandemic had well the strongest restrictions had stopped, so it was very liberating to get a bicycle and just to cruise along the riverbed. It was amazing just to kind of see how alive the city is. Like there's different, you know, there's a baseball pitch, there's football pitches, there's people just relaxing. It, it's amazing. It really is um, well worth the visit. But like say. In small groups, <laughs> if not, <Yeah>. don't. <laughs> no, uh, if not, you don't have the the the, the citizenship uh, yeah. uh, understanding. So uh, I, I invite, and I think I invite not only to Valencia to uh, to to everywhere. I mean, uh, this this movement is growing uh, everywhere, especially in, in in Europe. Is my my feeling mm -hmm. that uh, the city centers are being close. I I love Bordeaux in in France. There are there are cities and energy from France. Uh, uh, in England, the center of London. I was there ten years ago, and I will be hopefully this summer again. I mean, the, from the circular ring inwards, you have only electric cars and and public transport. And uh, and and when I visited ten years ago, after ten years before, it was really amazing. And I think that today is even better. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the cities are for the citizens and public transport is, is great. So as soon as we use that, we can love our cities. Yeah, it's a good place to be. Yeah. Um, and going back to the, the business side of things or the environment and business, you mentioned before a few years ago, I'm at 10 or I'm not sure how many, but you mentioned a few years ago that people were not interested as much in, especially from a business sense, like being involved in the protection of the environment or being green. So when you first started or, you know, back then, did you find a lot of pushback against your agenda to be more green in these companies? Was it hard for you to get investments or, or you know, get people involved, whether that's governments or 
like say investors was it difficult or compared to now I, I'm, I'm a guy that I like to put the energy uh, in the right measure to make the wheel move, okay? So uh, 10 years ago, it was not worthy to put too much energy. I mean, you you, you were trying to move the mountain. Uh, so the situation was was really, what are you talking about? The business is business and, and planting trees is a different thing. And so <laughs> to make to make understand, to make it understand, uh, it is not so easy because it's, it's a complete uh, economical model. So um, as as it used to happen, it now is a mix of regulation uh, and social pressure. Uh, this uh, background noise is really starting to make the companies things either because they realize that uh, yeah the world is changing, or if not, the world will change us. And, and we kill us either pragmatically I, they have regulations that if they don't meet them the banks will stop to give them credit uh, or the talent will run away uh, so they, they have no choice uh, and, and from, from the experience with, uh, with Sarape Social uh, and how they are leading the companies to modify their ESG, their environmental, social, and governance, we see that transformation. People calling us and saying, come on, guys, tell us which are the regulations that we have to meet, and we make a very nice presentation. And then we start to explain them, uh, look, have you think about your talent? Let's organize a couple of workshops with your people. And people is telling them, uh, yeah, I think that if you don't take care of the planet, <laughs> we would rather go with companies that take care of the planet. Um, and taking care of the planet is inside the company and outside the company. I mean, you uh, to to spend it the right time, to have the right means to work, but also assuring that your uh, logistic chains or your products are sustainable. So uh, this sensibility is growing a lot, uh, and now it's much easier. Much easier. It's not because we are very good convincing the companies. It's because the the social pressure and the social boost is is coming coming very fast so it's 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 coming from the change is coming from just an average person like me cares more now so what how we spend our money has changed we we are more concerned about a good company is that what's that's how that's why companies are more concerned now about being green because the consumer is more interested in it yeah the, the consumer but we all are consumers workers, uh, producers, and final customers. So for whatever reason, the companies are interested to to respect that. You see, 10 years ago, we, we are in the work environment. We don't talk about uh, green. I'm green, I'm, I'm, I'm recycling, I'm just planting trees. And and, and now it's, you go into the companies and they have... Uh, a display just saying we have done so much kilowatts today with our solar solar panels so we have 15 percent of our production from the uh, and and this is creating not only a benefit to the company but the workers feel good every day that they reach 20 or 25 percent of of the electric consumption through the solar panels uh, so they say i'm in a company which is green not because the CEO is making pictures with a forest behind, but because we are measuring and we can demonstrate that we are reducing our carbon footprint. So we are talking more and more about that in a very serene way, very uh, calm way. So we, it's not a, a, a revolution, it's simply a, a calm change. We are adapting, we are getting the good habits. Most of the people is doing as much as they can to recycle. So uh, many people is, is, is also very drastic. So no no plastics. There are still people for sure that uh, they don't mind. But uh, I think that the, the big amount of people is, is has a certain level of, of, uh, of sensibility. Uh, and that means that the change is, is taking place. And, and sadly, we have summers that are reminding us that in Valencia we used to have like three, four days with 40 degrees. Uh, so what we call Poniente is coming from the sunset direction. 
from the uh, west. Uh, so we, it is really hot those days. Last summer, we have 40 days, one after the other, with more than 40 days, uh, 40 degrees. So, well, and, and possibly this summer it will be a long period also. So, uh, I mean, the, the nature is starting to tell us, look, guys, um, you have, the open is open, so you need to close it. Wow, that is quite scary, yeah. yeah. Um, well, d- tell me a little bit more about one of the companies you, you're working with. For example, I found it really interesting to hear about um, or to read about Ocean 6 because okay. it said on the website, we challenge current thinking processes and methodologies. And I just wonder what, what is the the innovation in that company specifically? Like what, what are they, or what are you, or what are they doing um, as a, a company? Okay. I, I really like that question because I, uh, I think that uh, this is really a very uh, human oriented perspective. I mean, the change is going to, the, the, the change is going to come into the world because there are people behind. Okay, so like uh, like one year ago, I I, I was really lucky to meet uh, Gat Ramon. Uh, Gat Ramon is the founder of Ocean Six, and uh, he has been working for plastic recycling for more than twenty years with pallets. Uh, and and he decided, look, I want to make a company that make the difference. Uh, I want to make the six ocean. So we have already five. The oceans, and it's what we used to say in our foundation, the ocean save us. The planet is uh, livable because the oceans are there, uh, providing carbon capture, oxygen, uh, and temperature equilibrium, and many more things. Uh, so uh, he said, I want to create the six ocean, uh, which w- is going to be for the first two and a half, three years, a pure innovation company looking for products that will change the world. Mm. Uh, and he's a businessman. And he said, I, I want uh, a, a one billion uh, business to be developed, but it will make the world different, either in uh, avoiding single-use packaging so reusable packaging, which is a must for the future. We cannot continue to, to use plastic and cardboards. And uh, so you need to reinvent the whole logistic around that and the reverse logistic, either with agriculture. Agriculture needs to change. We will not have water in the future. So we, we need to use the water properly and to have the right means to, uh, to manage the water. And as we said before, cities, uh, cities is the best place to live, is the most sustainable uh, because you can earn a lot of transport, uh, you can uh, have things surrounding you, but we need to make them sustainable. So either producing hydrogen, producing electricity, capturing carbon, uh, I mean, all those technologies need to be developed at city level. Uh, so you make the cities really more sustainable. So they, they are the big lines for sure. I cannot uh, tell you which are the specific projects we are <laughs> we're working on, but as you can imagine, it's an amazing, an amazing project. Uh, and it is behind one person and the energy of, of that person uh, to transmit it to us. So um, yeah, and this is happening in Valencia, which is really great. Oh, brilliant. Okay. That is, that is really, yeah, because I was thinking, you know, I, I obviously know you, you cannot tell me the specifics of, you know, what you're working on, but I think it's really interesting because there's loads of areas, I believe, which we don't realize can be used to benefit us. Um, I did see a news article today about um, the gates or the turnstiles for the metro in Paris that have been turned into a way to generate elect- um, power and electricity. Because when people push through them, they use that power to to make electricity, and it's like, well, why do we never think of that before? So you know what what Ocean Six um, mentioned is that they're challenging the thinking process. So I imagine there's probably something like that happening, and it's it's really exciting. I think to uh, to imagine you know what are these things that we don't use we could use to benefit us. So uh, I mean, I, I'm convinced that in in five 
10 years, there will be many companies like Ocean 6, precisely because it's as you have said, Chris, right now, uh, we are not thinking in that direction. Uh, for us, energy is just behind the bottom. You just have it, you stop it, you have it, you stop it. Uh, but when you want to be sustainable, you are, you are interested to produce as much energy or to recover as much energy as possible. That energy could be neglectable, but could be enough just to power uh, the tickets machines that are close to there or the equivalent. So, okay, that's better than, than nothing. And, and, and the little engine m many times is there. So, yeah, it's as you said, I, I have seen solutions like the ties uh, for the pedestrians. So as you are walking, uh, you are producing uh, electricity. Uh, but from the, it, this development has to be uh, still work a little bit, okay, to make it simple. Uh, because if not, I mean, there is nothing so robust like the pedestrian desk uh, way. Uh, but, uh, but we are in the right way when we are thinking in this direction. And, and we need to assure that we start thinking sustainable. And, and this is a very good example, what, uh, what you said. And we can recover many energy only just moving. So you have jackets that have little, uh, little motors uh, or dynamos that so just by moving, you can charge your telephone or you, you recover the energy that, that you are using. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Um, Fascinating. Yeah. Many, many, many fields. I don't want to, uh, to, <laughs> to give you all the... All the no, it's, it's good stuff. Can you give me an idea? Yeah. Yeah, just uh, the, the one that I have to mention is batteries. I mean, you, you see so many debates about the technology of batteries that we have today. But in five years, we are going to have batteries which has nothing to do with the batteries that we knew 10 years ago. Because the, the batteries of 10 years ago were developed with the mindset of we have all the energy and if they are not efficient, it doesn't matter. But now we really need to have very efficient batteries which last as long as possible, which are safe. With, so you have a different paradigm to develop with them. Uh, and for sure, they are going to be incredibly more efficient than what we have today. Well, I believe, well, by what you told me, I believe that this industry is becoming quite popular, you know, being green. So I imagine it, it can be quite competitive. So my question is, what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? In, in, in a way, uh, we are thinking, we are talking about uh, innovation. Okay. And, and innovation has uh, a simple rule. Uh, which is be sure that what you are innovating or developing has a value for the society. And that, that's what is making the things different. Um, I mean, the, the new capitalism is sustainability. Uh, so you, you need to assure that what you are doing uh, is respectful with the nature because you will attract funding. You will attract customers. Uh, and it has to provide value, okay? Because we mm. we can see things that are very sustainable, but at the end of the day, you, well, as as always, you you have innovations that do not provide too much value. They are very wow effect, but uh, uh, but yeah, a simple. Um, you see the, the solutions that you find into the electric cars that made them really efficient. Uh, you have bicycles that are now incredible. Uh, before bicycle was what something just to make sport uh, or to use from time to time. Now it's becoming a, a vehicle that you use it every day, and and it's amazing the amount of innovations that you have with electric urban bicycles. Uh, uh, what you can do with them? How many kilometers you can do? How you can park them? How you can lock them? Mm -hmm. uh, so. This, this world of innovation is changing and it's all around kind cities and, and customers that really want to, to work differently. So I, I, I would suggest to, uh, to concentrate on those markets, uh, those mm, uh, customers that love to, to live uh, in a city or in an environment that is respectful um, and you will see the, the key driver will be the fund. 
Uh, indeed, sometimes we have too much funds. Uh, uh, so things that are not very valuable are also funded. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's triad and error. So it, it is growing the level of expertise. Uh, so um, my second big uh, uh, suggestion is that be ready to fail because the more you fail, the more you learn. Uh, one of the very good things that we have in Valencia, and we are not the only city, but uh, this is a formula that you find in many cities, is that you have uh, uh, greenhouses for uh, startups. Uh, and you have many of them. You have the big one from Lanzadera in, in Valencia Harbor, but there are other companies that are promoting uh, these ideas funding and supporting them with a structure and coaching for those companies. Mm. Either you succeed, welcome, perfect. If you don't succeed, they are creating a level of talent that companies are really waiting for them to help them to improve, to develop, to have this mindset, not to do the things as always, but to do the things in a different way. So you are creating an environment thanks to the people that is trying uh, and failing or succeeding. So uh, yes, just try it. Just look for value and try because however, you will get, it will be successful. Okay. you learn something from it, right? Yes. Interesting. Um, well, just going on to the other part I thought was really interesting about your career is that You've you've experienced many many cultures. So, tell us a little bit about how that happened. You know, how did it go? How did your life go from living in Valencia to other places and studying in other places as well? How did that happen? Yeah. So, uh, as I I told you before, this is very related with this uh, child experience having neighbors that were talking German in different languages. So I said, look, it means that there are places which uh, are thinking differently, uh, talking differently, and this attracted me a lot. And it was there. So um, I, since my whole career, I wanted to, to study and to work in different countries. And I tried to do as much as possible during the career uh, with Erasmus and, and, and these kind of opportunities. And I was very lucky to get my first job in Geneva to work in CERN, in, in a big laboratory uh, for physics, uh, with more than 90 countries and nationalities. So I said, wow, this is what I really like. You, you can imagine with uh, 21, 22 years old, every Friday there was a party and with uh, Chinese, Americans, uh, Slovaks, Turks, uh, uh, from everywhere in Europe. So, uh, first of all, my, my feeling is that I'm, I really love, I, as you detect, I really love Spain, Valencia, for sure. But I feel European. I, I feel my feeling is uh, European. And uh, thanks to that, I, I start working in Geneva and then I succeed to work in Foresia, which is a global company. And thanks to them, I was uh, 10 years working in, in France. But thanks to that period in Foresia, uh, I, I was able to visit India uh, and to visit China and, and to visit Japan. And I said, okay, perhaps I'm misleading a little bit. And, and, and then my sustainability mindset was growing. And I said, I feel really a, a citizen of the world. I mean, everywhere they have their own culture uh, and, and we are uh making a big mistake when we go into a country and say and judge them no we should say why why they do their things differently because they this is the distillation this is uh, of their history and their experience uh so i really like to observe that and to see the difference because as you said before you we learn just seeing how the people organize themselves respect understanding uh, when you travel, when you live in those countries and you learn massively to talk with them. You, you know that, that there is a massive laboratory nowadays in the world, uh, which is China. 
And I really appreciate having conversations with them, very calm conversation in a restaurant about what is democracy and what you can do in Europe and what is China and what you can do there. And, and at the end of the day, you have pros and cons. Uh, so uh, I would like to find for sure the, the right balance uh, between them. But uh, I, if I go to China and I don't open my eyes, for sure I'm missing a lot of uh, learning because there are people living there having uh, good lives and uh, providing to the world many things that in the in the next years we will see that they are very, very bar- valuable. I, I used to say that China will be the new America. Uh, the, uh, so we will see, unless they decide to uh, to go into Taiwan and things like that. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> well, I think it's really interesting, especially when you mentioned about the, um, the green aspect of your career as well and that you've been to places. Because from my experience living in Japan, I was actually living there I lived there for three years in total and I think it really taught me about respecting the environment more because they everywhere is so incredibly clean and there's no bins on the street there's nowhere to put your rubbish and it's it's just insane how they are able to keep everything insanely clean how they respect everything so much and I I took that with me and you know I tried to implement that now as well as some other things um so I'm just curious, did anything affect you like that in any of the other countries that you took away from it? You're like, yeah, I'm going to take this back to Spain or, or just with you personally. Is there anything in particular? For 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 sure, I, 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 this is my experience. Every time that I have been in a, in a country, I, I have learned things that I take back from, from India. I, I learned the value of the effort. Uh, I mean, I have that experience when I was 12 years old working and doing my best to, to work. And now the society is so gentle uh, with the kids in, in Europe that when you go there, uh, you see that they uh, have now access to, uh, to education and to uh, means and to technology. And they make a massive uh, profitability of that. They try to make as much as possible from their learning. They try to travel, to go uh, to uh, to the States, to Europe, wh- whatever, t- to get better knowledge. So this fighting to learn and to progress, uh, coming from situations where we're very poor, uh, is, is a very, very good lesson. Another very good lesson is also from Japan. I, I was there one week uh, when when we were bought by Hitachi. So the European team and the uh, uh, Japanese team, we, we got together uh, just to mix both cultures and to try to understand one from the other. And what uh, I realized is up to which extent uh, Japan is an amazing culture and one of the facts uh, that is very surprising for the Europeans and that many times we don't realize is that Japan has never ever been invited by a different culture. I mean, in Europe you have Romans, you have Cartago, you, you have Celts, you, you, you have influence from Arabs, from from everywhere and, and it means that uh, Today, even in France, in Germany, in Spain, you have different regions and different cultures. So you need to make you understand with people that perhaps has not the same background. So we like to talk, we like to explain the things, we, we, we understand that, that the origin can be different. Japanese, Japan is completely different uh, because from them, the things are like they are for forever. Uh, so... Uh, they they understand each other much easily. They don't need so much words. Their language and uh, writing is uh, stable for for centuries. So it is really making making the difference. That's why it's very complex to change things there. Uh, but at the same time, respect and uh, uh, is is very important for them. Uh, so uh, yeah, in a- every time that you go to a country, if, if you have your eyes open, you will learn things. So uh, I really try to to keep that lesson as much as I I can. Yeah. So you have a lot of experience working in a multicultural uh, office or environment, right? 
Um, so I'm just curious, how do you approach understanding perspectives of a coworker who has a different background from yours? Like, how do you, how do you explain things or, you know, what do you do normally? Well, I, I think that, uh, the first, the first, very first step with my coworkers is to understand their background. Uh, and this many times start with the selection process. So we, um, uh, for me, the, the key element is to have, to be open-minded. Okay. So, so I, I, I'm not looking for uh, specific skills or experience. I think that the richness is coming from, uh, from all, all the areas. Yesterday we were having an interview for, a for a new position in, in Ocean 6 and um, and the guy was saying, "Yeah, but I'm not, uh, I'm not an engineer, you know." And say, "And what? Uh, why? Why do you say that?" Because he considered that for innovation, you need to be an engineer. I said, "No, no, do you? You need to be creative. How are you solving things?" And he started to give examples. So they said, "You see, you you have the right mindset. You are not blocked. You are not considering that the things uh, like that." Remember Edison. Edison was not an engineer, even he has problems because his teacher was a really a rubbish guy, uh, and his mother take the responsibility to to educate him. But he has the right eyes to look for businesses, and and he has so many patents because he uh, he understood that uh, when he has a good business, he make a patent, he sell it, and he get more money for other things. So. Uh, just to be open-minded and creative uh, is what I look for in, in my coworkers, uh, and and I try to be as respectful for them uh, in terms of uh, of activity. So I like to to do regular revisions of the objectives and the way of working, and I like to tell them, look, and that these two lines in the objectives are white. You see them; they are white. They are for you. Because uh, you are the best one to do your job. I'm here simply to organize the team. So if you have an idea, if from your training, your experience, whatever, and you consider that we can add this objective, just let me know. And we agree that and we put it here. So um, uh, for me, this kind of creativity and this kind of, uh, of proactivity are, are the key elements for, uh, for the co-worker. From there... I, I try to allow them to be as natural as possible. Okay, so just try to understand them, where they're coming from, and then just to try to to push them if they feel like they're blocked in terms of a, in terms of a way of you know just finding a way through or finding a different viewpoint so they can you know connect yeah. with you or express what they want to say. Or for me, the the, the key word, Chris, is motivation. We we. I don't like the people that is doing the things because I said is because they understand their objectives and they are motivated to mm. do that, not only to do it well, but to improve it and and uh, and to make every day the possibility to make it better. Uh, so coming with new ideas and uh, uh, yeah and 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 let them fly for me is is very important. Yeah, right. Give them a platform. Interesting. Um, all right, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Alfred. I have to stop you there. We're almost out of time. And uh, I imagine you're a very busy man involved in three companies. So I, w I will let you go. I could talk with you for hours. It's very, very interesting. I think everyone listening would agree. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you to you. Thank you, Chris. It has been a pleasure. All right. All the best. Thank you.